You're watching Teaching and Learning Priorities in the First Weeks of General Practice, produced by GP Supervision Australia and presented by Dr. Simon Morgan and Dr. Jess Wrigley. We would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which this recording was produced and pay our respects to their elders past, present, future and their families. Welcome to this third in the three-part series really targeting the new registrar in the practice and how you can best support them. I will refer to the first couple in a bit, but this is the sort of third element, which is really around teaching and learning priorities in the, the first weeks. And of course, as registrars navigate training, they're encountering learning needs the whole time. But this is very much focused on what they are likely to encounter and be aware of and perhaps not be aware of in those first critical weeks. My name's Simon Morgan. I'm a GP, a medical educator with GPSA and based in Newcastle. And I'm very happy to introduce my co-facilitator tonight, Jess Wrigley. I'm Jess Wrigley, also in Newcastle. I'm a GP at Awabakal, a medical educator with the college and also do some education work with GPSA. Jess and I are both educators with the RACGP with registrars, we do supervisor PD, and I think having that bit of a roadmap as to what we're trying to cover is really help your registrar identify them, how you can address them and support them with your own availability, approachability as a supervisor, but with key resources, which we'll touch on as well. Managing uncertainty. We will actually be talking about this and to this. Duncan Howard, the author of a paper called Deer in the Headlights, presented research evidence around how overwhelming the first early weeks were, how much stress the registrar had, how much weight of responsibility they carried, and a whole lot of that is around this uncertain environment. Considering that whole metamorphosis, that sort of transition of the registrar quite quickly from this very, and this doesn't, isn't meant to sound pejorative, but naive new learner to, you know, really getting their head around it relatively quickly. Time management, I think I went as far to say to a group of registrars recently, don't worry about it. Now, I know that's probably going to cause a little bit of consternation because, of course, we have to worry about it. But in those early weeks where we're really GPT-1s are meant to be seeing patients half hourly and really trying to just survive, time management, I think, is much less critical. Clearly, if they're trying to address multiple issues and, and they're still getting swamped, but trying to really hone those skills in the early weeks, I don't think is a reasonable expectation. Having said that, this is a really important skill for registrars to learn. And lastly, near misses, random case analysis probably is the quintessential way of identifying near misses, because they're often the things the registrars don't come with or they're near miss and nobody really knows. But the unknown unknowns, uncovering those in, in the notes is probably a good way of doing it. So, you have a registrar indeed of any level of training or indeed maybe a doctor coming from another environment. Identification of learning needs is so important because it's such a broad scope. How can registrars identify their learning needs? It's not your job. And I think that's a really important point to make, even in those early weeks, although you can help them, but it's their responsibility to identify learning needs. But you can help them and clearly there's a lot of things we can do. What do you do? Call for help list. And the easel MCQ reports, which of all, I'm hoping a lot of registrars are bringing those to you as their supervisor to discuss that. Direct observation, talking about known unknowns, like just sort of talking to the registrar about that. And then a daily list of uncertainty from patients or I guess similar yeah. to a discomfort log. Great. A good list and a familiar list to you and one that you'll see in this document. If you haven't had a look at our guide on helping your registrar plan the learning, have a look, very readable, probably even better, refer your registrar to it, ask them to read it, and that'll really help them do this well. Known unknown or unknown unknown, this is all what it's about. So I was thinking about this and it's actually very, very easy to get confused when you look at something like this. And particularly because known is such an oddly spelled word, if you look at this long enough, it's very mind boggling. And it actually depends who's looking at it. Is it the supervisor looking at the registrar or is it the registrar looking at themselves as to which bit sticks out of the water? But I like to think of this as the learning needs iceberg and try not to interpret it because you'll say, Simon, it's, it's not quite right. But 
basically there's all these unknowns under the surface. It's our job to help our registrars identify them. And I think this is a bit more accessible perhaps than the standard Joe Hari window that you've seen presented in more academic fora. Sometimes the registrars want to know about the what of the consultation and don't pick up that they need to learn more about the how of the consultation. That's great. What strikes me when I hear these comments is how not only useful they are to be made and appears to hear them, but how you can use them with your registrar. So yeah, you will focus on the what, but actually I want to support you to focus on the how. That's a great quote. So there's a good list, very similar to what you've covered, and we'll unpack that a little bit. Past experience, clearly we are going to have a little bit of a role play a little later and the registrar that will be part of that, you know, has done quite a mix of terms, but only three years post completion of medical training. But of course, you know, getting a sense of their background training, past exposure is really useful. We'll talk about self-assessment, we'll talk about objective assessments, and really importantly on supervisor assessments. In terms of self-assessment, we hunted high and low to find what is now a bit of a historic document, this old confidence grid. This is the old Went West version, but I think it's obviously been pilfered from somewhere else. And this is a very long list of clinical topics, and I think some other non-clinical domains of practice, which I'm not sure, Jess, which is something that maybe I'd ask an early registrar to do off the bat because it could be quite overwhelming actually to look at sort of 17 pages of possible clinical things that might walk through the door but it is something that we know registrars use as they prepare for exams and certainly the old gp synergy supervisors might be familiar with a thing called the matrix which was a exam focused document that i know the registrars still use but that's one thing. The call for help list, I think, is a really refined version of this, and it's certainly evidence-based. Jared Ingham was the lead author and researcher to develop this, and great to see how widely people are talking about that now. And just patient encounters. The Brits call this, I think, a discomfort log. This is really about patient encounters thinking, I just don't know what to do. This is something I'm challenged by, and having some mechanism, and that's where the notebook comes in to write it down. Some process to capture learning needs. And it is remarkable, Jess and I as MEs for RSCGP here in New South Wales so commonly would talk to registrars who just don't have any mechanism of capturing learning needs. It just doesn't exist. They just think, oh, I didn't know that, but it disappears. And of course, there's no better way to learn than basing it in the experience of a patient encounter. So there are a few self-assessment tools. Now, at risk of controversy, in that the easel mcq is not accessible to you as supervisors but the, the results are and that is a limitation and frustration but i still think a raw score and also this comparison between a registrar's score on each question and their confidence in answering it is a useful tool and i know jess saw one of these quite recently which was quite striking in the disparity between the many incorrect scores and the high level of confidence with which they were answered. So of course, this is very blunt. It's 70 questions across general practice. It's just a one measure, but it can be useful. But most importantly, talking about supervisor assessments, we're talking about things like direct observation and other formative assessment methods, problem case discussion, inbox rear random case analysis and those sorts of things. It's just a little bit of a refresher on some of these topics. What are your top tips? What have you found to be really useful to implement random case analysis? If you were to tell your new colleague, look, it's a great method and I'd really recommend you do this or this or this when you do it, what would they be? Everyone's pretty familiar with it now, the, the ESOL recommendation or requirements are, are really just the standard way of approaching it and you need to fill in a completed form that you keep in the practice. But yeah, what are the tips? What, how can you make this a really rich education experience for the registrar? Making sure the case is recent enough that the registrar can recall extra detail that might not be in the notes. Don't make it random. As supervisor, you have to be prepared and choose the cases before the teaching, looking at everything that the registrar's done on a day and maybe choosing ones that you feel there's some holes, doing like a reverse RCA, so doing your own patient records, let the registrar pick and then you pick theirs. So this is something that many of you are doing and will be doing more of. And I would refer you to the original paper on it. 
We've chosen three things. So tailor the discussion to the stage of training. So obviously, you know, you could start asking a whole bunch of what ifs, which is our third tip here. But of course, if, you know, if it is their second week of practice and they don't know how to turn the computer on and they don't know how to even reassure a patient about something and they're feeling quite at sea, that might be very challenging. So we really have to tailor it. But if there's scope, use the what ifs, particularly for a highly functioning registrar. And of course, it is so tempting and so easy and so naturally where one wants to go to stick with the clinical because the registrar wants that and you're comfortable with it. And it's often really the majority of the case is the clinical, but really push yourself to say, is there a professionalism issue or can I think about some sort of aspect of communication or, you know, was there an organisational point that I can raise from this? So it can be fun in that regard. Someone almost, I guess, is describing signposting what's going to happen in the RCA session as well, which is great. So, you know, pick a patient, tell me what you did, and then I'll ask you what about questions. I think that's good and, and reinforcing. It might seem like you're nitpicking or being critical, but it's all about learning. And Fantastic. And what you can see on the right there is the how to do random case analysis resource that we have developed. It is one of now five teaching method how-to resources. And I think that's a fantastic tip to include because if registrars know what they expect, then I think they're going to be far more comfortable with the process. Certainly we've run supervisor PD sessions with RCA in the early days and we'd go around after the end of the session and the supervisor playing the registrar would say, oh man, that was just harrowing. We said, what do you mean? They said, people just ask me what ifs and they're nailing me and saying, you know, tell me more. And I said, I guess this isn't real life, but you know, clearly that notion of signposting as we do in consultations can be very useful. On the left is the RACGP version of the RCA document, which is slightly longer. Secondly, and this is our very brief sort of whip through some of these key methods just to sort of remind you about them, is problem case discussion. Arguably, probably the most common teaching and learning method in practice. I I have a few questions to ask about a few patients I've seen. Can we sit down and talk about them as part of a teaching session or at the end of the day? And hopefully with your new GPT ones, lots of opportunity for that for case review. And they're going to have lots of problem cases. In fact, I think as I've heard, every case for a new GPT one is a problem case for a little while until they know who the best orthopedic surgeon is for an arthroscopy or in fact that maybe arthroscopy is not good practice anyway. Top tips for problem case discussion. Be open-minded to just be available and make sure you set aside the time so it's not a rushed half discussion. I think yep. that's actually really important. And lots of open-ended questions. As part of those early, in terms of clinical supervision and moving through those stages, those levels of supervision, where we're really trying to nudge supervisors and registrars and the whole system towards closer supervision early on, obviously within the constraints of patient load and workforce and the rest of it, but really just trying to make that oversight a bit more rigorous and a bit more regular. Much of what we're talking about will be actually routine. There's hopefully most of the cases will be just kind of reviewed. As the level of supervision drops off a bit, you know, obviously the problem case discussion comes into its own in terms of registrars driving their learning with this sort of thing. In learning things, it's important to reinforce to the registrar that, you know, it's easy in retrospect to make comments on, on what was done and that sort of thing. In the PQRST framework, being open-minded, I mean, if they choose a treatment plan, try to understand why they chose that, what guidelines or resources they may have used, you know, what their line of thinking was, that sort of thing. Because it is um, so easy, isn't it, with the retrospectoscope to say, oh, you should have done this, and now look, it's evolved into this. But it's so different when you're in the thick of it with the patient. That's a really nice comment to make to a registrar. Yeah, and I think obviously it applies to any learner, but I think especially registrars in their early weeks where they're still very much transitioning from usually hospital-based doctor into the world of community medicine, you know, it, it does require a mindset shift. And I think sometimes what might seem obvious to an experienced GP isn't the case for someone far more junior. Thank you. So I guess the PQRST, but even any type of framework, some sort of 
approach that it just, I don't know, gives a bit of structure to how it's done. And the structure, if it includes some of these things, a problem representation. So please describe the case, you know, succinctly and with the key features and the demographics of the patient and the nature of the illness and those sorts of things. Explicitly think about reasoning. So as you're listening to the registrar talking and you're asking questions, asking yourself, how well is this registrar reasoning? And of course, that I'll hold ask before tell. So if you want to have a look at our how to, that's it there. Again, available on the website. And lastly, and the thing we're going to focus on in a minute is, of course, direct observation. And this is something that you've been doing for a long time, you're very familiar with. Again, having said that, we know that sometimes it could be done a bit more regularly, and we know that registrars really value it. It's part of DCTVs, of course. And the whole process has changed to a degree with mini CEXs, this sort of more formal way of capturing the information. And very lastly, a few very quick tips. I remember doing a teaching visit. So it was a little different context to being a supervisor in the practice, but a teaching visit at a practice I used to work. And every patient I saw that morning knew me and basically spent the whole time talking to me because I'd only just left the practice. And it was very disarming. I didn't expect that that would happen. And so the registrar would say, tell me about your back pain. And the patient would look at me and I didn't expect that. So maybe I could have preempted that. Picking up views from patients' body language, yep. which I think is really important. And I think attention is such a big part of that. You know, often the registrar's attention is on the computer or on their next move rather than the patient. A common observation mm -hmm. in GPT-1s who are so kind of, so busy and anxious and focused on what the next question is or how to make the script work, that they often miss what might be a fairly obvious and non-verbal cue for a more experienced GP. Being there without interrupting the consultation, so I <clears> guess that includes making sure you're positioned not, you know, in the direct line of sight and unless something's truly immediately dangerous, resisting the urge to. Yeah, and then I know as a one of a team of medical educators who do teaching visits as opposed to supervisors sitting in with registrars. We all have very different thresholds to interrupt. It's quite interesting. Some of us pop in very early, but I think on the whole, it's good practice really to bite your tongue and sit on your hands and, and let the consultation flow. You're going to get more information that way, unless there's some catastrophe about to unfold. I think not interrupting is, is useful. I always start an observation visit with asking the registrar, not telling them to do anything, asking them not to do anything differently. As in, don't pretend that I want to see a, a medical student long case. I don't want you to throw this preventative care in or do a three minute explanation of something that you'd normally spend 20 seconds explaining. Do it like you do it. You know, you're a GP, I'm a GP. Just let me see how you normally practice. And I guess that might speak to some of those other comments, isn't it, about kind of signposting about giving a heads up as to what you want. Writing down quotes I think is really powerful and I think that's often not done. People sit in and listen, but if you write the words, they're written down. That's what was said by the patient or by the registrar. And then when you come back to it, you know, it's not quite as powerful as video, but you are basically reflecting exactly what, what happened. Unless of course you're transcribing correctly. And some sort of framework and obviously the colleges will provide something often to use as part of that. And there's our how-to for direct observation with a bit of a guide, the soft approach, setting it up, observing, feedback, informative assessment, and some teaching. So have a look at that if you'd like a reminder. All right, so we've talked about identification of learning needs. Registrars obviously have a yarn. Registrars can do some kind of self-assessment. They might do something objectively like an ESO MCQ. And your role early on as part of their commencement in the practice doing these supervisor assessments, RCA, direct observation, case discussion, and a bunch of other things. But we know it's going to be very likely that there's early learning needs that are common for all registrars. Of course, somebody who's done five years of obstetrics might be all over women's health, and somebody who hasn't is not going to have a clue when they see their first pregnant patient. But I guess we're going to try to focus a bit on what's likely common across the registrars. But in order to, I guess, illustrate this, Jess and I thought we'd do a little role play to give you a sense of how this might feed into what you're doing in, in the practice with your new GPT-1s. So we'd like to introduce you to Sinead, who is a GPT-1. 
and she, it's her second week of rural general practice. So she's brand new, she's come out of the hospital system having done three years, so she's currently PGY4, and a range of terms, the usual mandatory terms and a little bit more emergency. She's done a call for help list and there's certainly a few areas that she's very keen to seek your guidance on early if um, she comes across them, but you're relatively comfortable. You know, you've got a sense that she's a capable registrar and she scored 68% on her ESOL MCQ with no huge disparity between those that she got wrong and her level of confidence. In fact, I mean, she might be a little bit underconfident. She seems like a sound registrar. And you're doing a direct observation sit-in session with Sinead and she's seeing Michael. We're going to pick this consultation up halfway through. Essentially, the data gathering has occurred and Sinead has effectively taken a history, established that Michael, a 49-year-old high school teacher, is usually fit and well, no significant past medical history, no medications. He's a fit fella who doesn't smoke or drink much alcohol. But he's had eight weeks of this non-productive cough and she's explored that relatively well, certainly identified that there's no red flags and an examination of basic observations and chest was, was uh, within normal limits. So we'll pick the consultation up. I'll play Michael and Jess will play Sinead and we'll pick it up just briefly and really put yourself in the shoes. You're in the, the triangle bit of the room, so you're observing the patient, observing the registrar. You've seen this, you understand what her background is and just have a little bit of a think and maybe just reflect on, yep, I see that so often with GPT-1s or, you know, we'll tease that out a bit. So, Michael, you've had this cough for two months now, you've been telling me, and after having a conversation and listening to your chest, I'm not too worried about anything sinister going on, but considering how long it's been affecting you, I think we should get an X-ray. Oh, is the X-ray not there? I, actually, I was hoping to get the results today because um, when I saw Dr. Thomas last week, we organised it. I haven't heard anything, so I assumed it was okay. Oh, okay, yep. Um, just give me a sec. Um, uh, yeah, um, yeah I, I can see it here, yet yeah, it all looks fine. Oh, well, that's good. Look, do you think, I don't know, do you think that um, an x-ray is enough to pick up everything? Um, I don't know, would it miss something, I guess? You know, it's been going on for a while and I certainly don't want to um, miss anything and I've never had a cough like this before. Yeah, yeah look, the x-ray really looks normal um, and I think what we should do is trial a, a steroid nasal spray. I can do a script for you now um, and you need to use a morning and night in both nostrils. Um, I think give that a good go for a few weeks and then if it's still no better then come back and we'll have more of a chat. So like a puffer is it? Um, it's not quite a puffer, it's a nose spray so it goes up your nose and I know that might seem weird for a cough but this kind of cough can, you know, sometimes they really respond to the nose spray so yeah, I think we'll give that a go. Uh, okay, thanks. Let us know if you're still having trouble in a few weeks. All right, thanks, thanks. Doctor. Possibly no prizes for our acting abilities there but uh, we'll come out of roll now. We did our best in conceiving that script to just illustrate a few things. What types of things did you observe here that you might actually say, you know, this is something as a learning need from a clinical consultation, other domains? I wonder if the registrar actually looked at the chest x-ray film or just the report, and I think especially seeing as how rushed that was. Perhaps the registrar is not understanding the patient's concerns and also, you know, was the patient happy with the registrar's plan? How was the diagnosis made? Again, talking about ideas, concerns, expectations, so certainly not picking up on the cues. Jumping to a treatment option seemingly because unsure what to do, I think that's definitely quite common, just wanting to do something. Yeah, and check the file before bringing the patient in. It's really important. And the provisional diagnosis, you know, what is it? It wasn't communicated to the patient. But certainly consult preparation, the patient's experience, differential, like diagnostic reasoning, why, you know, treatment reasoning. In a sense, this is teasing some of the content from the workshop that we'd run with new registrars, 
and fashioning that as for you, how can you identify these things and maybe support them in, in your registrars? So we've batched communication and consultation skills. And of course, some of those were covered in the alone webinar. We talk about clinical things and I'm not sure how much clinical content came out and there are lots and lots of non-clinical stuff, which I think is great because the clinical stuff can be learned. They can look this, that up and you can help them, but it's the consultation skills and the other soft skills I think so important. We will talk about uncertainty, organisational and professional aspects of care. And these are the ones we talked about. This is sort of prepper, isn't it, who's ready to be in their concrete bunker for a few years. Preparation. So these are, you know, so obvious to us who have practiced for many years, but sometimes you see them in your registrar. So preparation, getting a sense of when the patient was last seen, and we hope it looked awkward and clunky that our registrar had to go back and there was a result. And of course, what if it did show a, a malignant lesion or something else concerning? So that every time you call the patient in, you need to have a bit of a sense of when you last saw them and, and who they are and their background. Building rapport, the ice stuff that we talked about, having some sort of diagnostic framework. So this isn't, we're not really going to elaborate here, but you know, you might start introducing Murtaugh's framework and other sort of diagnostic approaches even early on. Explanation, I think this is something that's good to see come out and something we laboured a little bit, but I must say probably my experience as a teaching visitor over the years, if there's one thing that early GPT ones do poorly, it is explaining to the patient. So they will often take a good history, examine the patient, and even concoct a reasonable management plan based on what they've done. And it's all okay, but this bridge between the two just is absent. And so there's no explanation of, of what they're doing. And I'd like to think this registrar might be very sound. She's thinking, maybe we need to exclude something significant. Is it asthma? But is it some respiratory cause we need an X-ray for? Is it post-nasal drip, even if that doesn't work? And you could ask, you know, where do you go then? She's talking about gourd and silent reflux. That might be all clinically sound. A patient has no clue. And this, as you know, is not artificial. This happens all the time. So one really important, I think, learning need is how to give a good explanation and to do it. Shared decision-making, how does that sound? And of course, safety need we talked about. As we go through this, I'll just touch on some resources that we'd recommend. The consultation skills toolbox has been tidied up and we're really very proud of this document now or this resource now. It's essentially a library of resources for consultation skills. Have a look at that. And again, if you want to have a wade through, great, but maybe more importantly, just ask your registrar to have a look. Now they're going to be a bit overwhelmed as GPT-1, they've got a lot of stuff to look at. If you can help direct them to, this is the bit about building rapport, because really, you know, you are you looked anxious and it would be really good to try to make some more overt approaches around rapport building or explanations or whatever it be. Have a look at the toolbox and of course our teaching plans are not just clinical but they cover consultation skills like patient-centered care and those things. It's a bit like that old expression teaching someone to fish. If they know how to run a consultation they're going to catch lots of fish but clearly they'll also be interested in the clinical domain. Each consultation with each clinical presentation will uncover new learning needs in that regard. So they will want to know what this rash is and you will potentially be able to support them to look up pityriasis rosea, which they've never seen in hospital and they're going to see lots of and it's a great diagnosis to be made, which is good. But they can probably do most of that themselves. Again, our focus potentially, I think, is to help them identify the red flags. Maybe less of an issue with somebody with a benign looking rash, but potentially a patient with the cough or somebody with a headache, you know, tell me about your red flags. And also a really, really important early learning need, where do they go and what do you use? What are your go-to resources for a whole range of things? That is a few things that they'll be, they'll be happier with than you saying, these are my top 10 clinical resources. I mean, of course, Health Pathways is, probably the number one, but there's lots of others we use. In terms of clinical, because I'm happy to focus on it just for a bit, there are a whole range of non-familiar clinical scenarios that registrars will come across. They've been managing sick patients in hospital or well patients in outpatient departments, but there's a bunch of things that they're going to see as a GPT-1 probably really early 
and not have a clue about, and genuinely potentially not have a clue about. And I guess heading some of this off at the pass, or at least saying, here's a bunch of stuff that I know you're going to see. When you see it, come and talk to me. It might be in the call for help list. It may not be, but you know, I'm really happy to help you, or this is a good resource. What are some of those scenarios that you know that you see GPT ones go, well, oh, blimey, you know, I've been reciting drips, I've been assessing febrile patients on the wards, I've been seeing patients and outpatients, but I've never come across this. Rashes is the first one, which, yeah, molluscum is an example given, which is absolutely classic. And knowledge of over the counter medications and, you know, six week or even just general childhood immunizations. I guess patients using complementary and alternative medicine, like sort of being aware of what people are taking. Paediatric <laughs> cases, sexual health, the worried well. There's actually quite a long list when you think about it. Now, you might say, why are some of these in red? The ones in red have a teaching plan attached to them. The ones in black don't, which might be something we need to work on. But for many registrars, and this isn't exhaustive, of course, and many of them do come from the call for help list, but these are things I think, you know, you could almost have a screen grab of that list and say, these are really common and this is where you might go to get some support or focus on early teaching on those things because they are going to see workers' comp, they're going to see antenates, they're going to have people wanting skin checks, they're certainly going to have fitness to drive and all those things. And it's worth knowing that they're likely new, unfamiliar scenarios that really may rattle them. In terms of resources, GPSA have lots and lots of teaching plans. We've classified them as the top reasons for encounter, the top conditions managed, and by ICPC2 chapters, a body system chapter in high risk areas. So that's a good way of sort of thinking about them, but really pretty comprehensive in our teaching plans I know are a good resource for many. We also have a lot of clinical webinars and if any of those take your fancy, and certainly here's a list for the registrar, these are very good, very general practice focused clinical webinars on our uh, YouTube site. They're all basically how supervisors can support registrars to manage these things better. One of the core themes or big themes we talked about was managing uncertainties. How do we do this? How on earth do we say to a new GPT-1, one of your learning needs is to manage uncertainty when they're anxious and feeling overwhelmed? That is a really challenging thing. You could, I guess, have a look at our guide on that, which is, I must say, a good resource and possibly even better ask your registrar to read it and have a yarn to you about it. Normalising it would help. I think that actually is like excellent step one so that the registrar doesn't just feel like it's them because they're mm. brand new and I mean obviously there will be things that they don't know of because they are new but that, that the whole experience of being uncertain is, is universal. Yeah, probably that is the answer, isn't it? It's mm. this is general practice, this is me, if not every day, a lot of days. This is me having worked for you know 25 years in general practice. It's still uncertain. I still have to manage it. I still find it difficult at times. You will manage it better with experience, and it's hard initially, but it's just part of it. You know, there are some well known and, and trusted strategies that a registrar may really, really value early on to say, "Oh my goodness." There's this thing called a recall system, which is, you know, makes me feel so much more comfortable that I'm not going to lose patients. Or, wow, a diagnostic pause by sending them out for a urine test means I can buy a little bit more time and look something up, or I can certainly give you a call. All those things. Again, helpfully, there's a call for help list, but that same article talked about the uncertainty flags. Here's a list that's come from sort of research. If you come across some of these, you know, which ones particularly worry you, give me a shout. Because I think this is a really nice list that maybe isn't being used as widely as the more specific items in the call for help list. I'm going to finish off with a couple of big areas, but of course there's a whole lot of organisational things, probably mostly around systems, notes, recall, reminders, referrals, those sorts of things. So recognising that some of those things are as important as some of those consultation skills. And I guess lastly, and I feel like we're shortchanging this, of course, this is a hugely important area. And you can, I think it's very reasonable to say, registrars in GPT-1 in the first weeks have some really, really early, urgent learning needs around professionalism. Commonly, you know, of course, the unprofessional registrar has them, but all registrars, I think. And, and I think this 
is around boundary setting, how to say no to patients, how to preserve the doctor-patient relationship in those instances. And also one really important one that we highlight is around new registrar seeing staff and how they manage requests to see staff and how your practice indeed does that. But of course that's a, you know, there are other other elements. Can I point you to, I've already talked about the teaching plans, another guide that we've got, which is more around the practice-based teaching, the formative assessment methods we've talked about. And we have a brand new teaching and learning toolbox, which is essentially a repository of resources around how to teach, how to do your role, your teaching role as part of your supervision role as best you can. So I'd refer you to that and have a look at some of the things we talked to. Professional boundaries can be much trickier for registrars in smaller communities, especially if you're the only practice in town. Yeah, absolutely. These are learning needs as important as how to manage the rash or how to safety net. It's around professional conduct. And, and if they are prominent in your setting, there's some common ones, of course, but how the expectations around coming to work on time, interacting with staff, finishing the day, you know, keeping your room tidy, all those sort of basic things which may need spot up, but of course there's some contextual ones that you might need to be more explicit about. I think you've all seen this slide. We do have a community platform. We've got a discussion forum, so if you're wanting to add to that. And lastly, this is a bit of a plug, so just a slight diversion from what we're talking about. If you, as a supervisor, are interested in contributing to a research project that we are running at GPSA, around best practice learning environments. We would love you to be part of it. And it's essentially translating this best practice framework called the GPCLE into a tool that practices can self-assess. Am I a good teaching practice? Am I a good learning environment? Is this tool useful to help measure that? And we'd be very keen to engage you on that. Thanks everyone for joining along. Thanks all, bye-bye. Thanks for watching. We'd love your feedback. Please comment or subscribe to our YouTube channel for updates on new videos. If you'd like to ask a question or suggest a topic, you can contact us via our website at gpsa.org.au. GP Supervision Australia is supported by funding from the Australian Government under the Australian General Practice Training Program.